I'd like to start with a quotation from Stravinsky from his Harvard lectures delivered about the time that I was born. And you can gauge from this where we are now. He writes at that time, we are living at a time when the status of man is undergoing profound upheavals. Modern man is progressively losing his understanding of values and his sense of proportions. This failure to understand essential realities is extremely serious. It leads us infallibly to the violation of the fundamental laws of human equilibrium. In the domain of music, the consequences of this misunderstanding are these. On the one hand, there is a tendency to turn the mind away from what I shall call the higher mathematics of music in order to degrade music to servile employment and to vulgarize it by adapting it to the requirements of an elementary utilitarianism, as we shall soon see on examining Soviet music. On the other hand, since the mind itself is ailing, the music of our time, and particularly the music that calls itself and believes itself pure, carries within it the symptoms of a pathological blemish and spreads the germs of a new original sin. The old original sin was chiefly a sin of knowledge. The new original sin, if I may speak in these terms, is first and foremost a sin of non-acknowledgement, a refusal to acknowledge the truth and the laws that proceed therefrom, laws we have called fundamental. There are repercussions then on creative activity. This was said in late 1939 at Harvard University. Three generations have only exacerbated the situation. Now in human history, this has happened many times. An examination of history, such as the one that Arnold Toynbee undertook some 60 years ago, surveyed 28 civilizations, and he found that 27 of the 28 died because of this particular problem. Now, the civilization that we live in has been dead for at least several generations. It's just running on reflex. It doesn't have any guts at all. And it certainly doesn't have any mind. And it never had much heart. So we're in a Robinson Crusoe kind of situation. We've got to learn to build thatched huts out of what's available just to maintain balance. So this education is not a luxury. This education is a first aid kit for just basic survival. On the other side, quoting Schiller, his 27th letter from his On the Aesthetic Education of Man, for those who are concerned with the glib, overreaching quality of these kinds of ideas, Schiller writes to his correspondent, you have no fear. You need have no fear for either reality or truth if the lofty conception of aesthetic semblance, which I put forward in the last letter, were to become universal. 
it will not become universal as long as man is still uncultivated enough to be in a position to misuse it. And should it become universal, this could only be brought about by the kind of culture which would automatically make any misuse of it impossible. To strive after autonomous semblance demands higher powers of abstraction, greater freedom of heart, more energy of will than man ever needs when he confines himself to reality. And he must already have left this reality behind if he would arrive at that kind of semblance. Now in the development and argument of on the aesthetic education of man, the very problems of value and proportion that Stravinsky, writing 150 years later, indicates had already come under severe siege. In Schiller's time, they were just beginning to be under the kind of siege that eventually um, demolished them, perhaps a better term, rather than demolish is evaporated. Because by the early 1940s, all of the values and proportions that has, had sustained Western civilization were indeed gone. In Schiller, at the beginning of this time of travail, in the late 1780s, when a whole range of perspicacious human beings began to have their ears go up, to have their eyebrows arch, to have their, their stare hardened, and realize that some catastrophic level of potential imbalance had been reached in the capacity of man as a being, as a species. One has only to remember that in the French Revolution they began numbering time with the year one. That particular time, this particular situation in Schiller, in order to be grasped, in order to be grasped in an appreciative wholeness, needs a symbolic conception called in Plato an idea. But the idea that Schiller uses in On the Aesthetic Education of Man is an idea that's only useful in the hands of a mature consciousness. It's misuse plagued the 19th century and the early 20th century. Now the powerful symbolic construction, the powerful idea that Schiller brought out consistently, forcefully, originally, in many respects, in On the Aesthetic Education of Man, was the observation that there is a typology there are types of human beings. There is a typology of man. And that that typology holds. And in that basic quality of typology, in the symbolism of types, the universal quality of bifurcation is an originating structure. It's not tacked on later. It's not derived from something else. It's what we would call axiomatic. It's given with the structural phenomenon, the bifurcation, the pairing. In Schiller's typology, we talked several times about how not only is there a fundamental pairing 
but that pairing itself is paired. That there's a reflexive quality, there's a recursive structure to an axiomatic symbolic structure. Indeed, even before it becomes a symbolic structure, it's there in the way in which existence is possible. Now that fundamental bifurcation has a logic, and its logic is severe. It's not movable by opinion. One of the first of the great Western logical minds to appreciate this was Leibniz. As a young man, hardly 20 years of age, Leibniz found himself in Holland in a series of discussions with one of the most wily Jewish intellects of all time, Spinoza. And Spinoza, who kept track of things to do with God, kept track of a divine geometry which was being disclosed, revealed, unveiled to man's appreciation in the 17th century, alerted Leibniz to a Chinese text with the, which the Jesuits in China had just translated into Latin. The text was that of the I Ching. And Leibniz was the very first man in Western civilization to understand the fundamental bifurcation of reality, which the I Ching uses as its synthesizing idea. It's a misstatement to think that it's expressed as yin and yang. Even in China, that's a very late, scholastic, academic add-on. It isn't yin and yang. That original bifurcation is Tao and Te. And its valuation from the beginnings, 3,000 years BC in China, its bifurcation was always zero and one. That zero and one was such an inherently real paredness that later on, when existence had called forth language expressive processes, and those were integrated and collected into symbolic forms. That original zero and one pairing bifurcation still had an expressive efficacy as to value and proportion. Leibniz was the first Westerner to write a monograph, a logical monograph, on these divine numbers these natural numbers of the Chinese. The University of Hawaii Press published an English translation just about seven or eight years ago. Because with zero and one, that binary bifurcation, that binary pairing, the complementarity nature of zero and one in tandem yields itself up to a differential consciousness. It does not only function as the archetypal integral synthesizing symbolic idea in nature, but has equally an applicable differential conscious application in terms of very large expressive meaning characterizations. That is to say, you can take zero and one, and you can make computers out of that. And anything that computers are capable of is because of that fundamental root. The teeth of the computers 
work logically because that bifurcation does not ever move in terms of its veracity vis-a-vis -vis value and vis-a-vis -vis proportion. And that man belongs on the center line, Frank Lloyd Wright would say, he belongs on the center line of that architecture. And not just the individual, not just the example of this individual in the species, but the whole species, the species as a whole, mankind, also has that quality, which allows for a typological characterization of man, beginning with fundamental bifurcation. Now, in Schiller, he didn't pay attention to the male-female bifurcation as much as he paid attention to the realist-idealist bifurcation. And it was this particular paredness that Jung, in his psychological types, drew out from Schiller and is indispensable, really, as a fundamental basis before male-female to have this bifurcation, this paredness, this beginning of a typology. Because frankly, in high Dharma states, male-female um, uh, polarities are transcended rather easily. But the realist-idealist bifurcation is not just there, courtesy of an academic issue. It's there consistently all the way from the origin. Now, in Jung's Psychological Types, 1921, about 140 years after Schiller made these points, Jung quotes Schiller at length in order to bring this particular idea about this pair together. It's worth reviewing. It's on page 168, 169, the bottom of 168, the top of 169 in Psychological Times. Jung writes, and at this time Jung was motivated to understand these problems for himself. Jung and Hermann Hesse both uh, went through, and Thomas Mann, all of three, went through a crisis during the First World War. Even Rilke. A lot of the advanced German language people at this time suffered a catastrophic collapse of psychic energy during the First World War. You remember Rilke couldn't write a single line of poetry for 10 years. Jung admitted himself as a patient to his own psychiatric ward for five years in a mental breakdown. Thomas Mann characterized that sojourn for him as a time when he was literally like, a, like Hans Kastorp in the Magic Mountain a patient at a tuberculosis retreat. Mann didn't go to the mountains particularly, but he went to the mountains inside of himself and committed himself. Hesse wandered all over Switzerland, unable to do anything. Nothing. Because there was nothing to work with. Because a complete catastrophic break like that polarizes psychic energy so that it flows one way or the other. There's no in-between at all. There are no shades of gray. It flows to zero or to one. And generally, because of a decompression, because of a regression, because of a recursive tendency, it almost always flows to zero. The happy God-blessed mystics are very few. Someone like Ramakrishna it flowed to one. <laughs> but with Jung, 
with Hesse, with Mon, with Rilke, it flowed to zero, as it usually does. Which means that your sense of value, the valuation capacity of the mind, becomes, I have to use an alchemical term, it becomes annealed to zero. It's closer than being glued. It's like being melted into zero. And it doesn't matter at that stage what you believe or who you are or what you've done. Zero obtains. Now that balance that holds one and zero together has something to do here with these psycho human psychological types, realist and idealist. Jung writes, in the same essay, Schiller's reflections lead him to a conception of two psychological human types. He says, and then he quotes Schiller's on the aesthetic education of man. And Schiller writes, this brings me to a very remarkable psychological antagonism among men in an age of progressive civilization, an antagonism which, because of its radical and rooted in the innate emotional constitution is the cause of a sharper cleavage between men than the accidental quarrel of interests, no matter what they are, could ever bring about. An antagonism which robs the poet and the artist of all hope of making a universal appeal, although this is his task which makes it impossible for the philosopher, in spite of every effort, to be universally convincing. Yet, nonetheless, this is involved in the very idea of a philosophy, and which finally will never permit a man in practical life to see his mode of action universally applauded. In short, an opposition which is responsible for the fact that no work of the mind no deed of the heart can make a decisive success with one class without thereby drawing upon it a condemnation from the other. This opposition is without doubt as old as the beginning of culture, and to the end it can hardly be otherwise save in rare individual subjects such as have always existed, and it is to be hoped will always exist. But although this lies in the very nature of its operation, that it frustrates every attempt at adjustment. Notice the perniciousness of the condition. It frustrates every attempt at adjustment. It's a devastating illness because its nourishing food are the attempts at adjustment. It doesn't give a shit what techniques you use or what you believe. It uses that energy. It's like an Andromeda strain, right? Any energy, feed me. And it's a very rare soul that discovers, like Pierre Bezukhov in Tolstoy's War and Peace, discovers that abject helplessness is the only way out when you're annealed to zero. The recognition consciously of abject failure is the only way out. Pierre Bezukhov. In War and Peace, along with all the other captives in Napoleon's retreat from Moscow in the snow, finally seeing that the inevitable glacial destruction of the Russian winter, taking its toll not only on Russian prisoners, but on French troops, and that it has absolutely no preference at all who it kills 
until finally the soldiers are as ragged as the prisoners. They begin intermingling, and no one knows who's guarding who. And in this hell, Pierre Zukov looks up, and for the first time in days, real tears well up. The warm salt water dissolves the glaze of frost that cemented his eyelids shut for days, and his blindness ceases. And he is able to see, and Tolstoy portrays this fantastic moment when he just simply gives everything up and looking up into the sky sees for the first time the snow the gray cease the foggy air evaporates and a blue sky appears like a vision above the ragged column and Pierre Bazukov without any Volition finds himself praying for all the men to come through into life, soldier and prisoner alike. That is grace under fire. <laughs> what Schiller is saying here is that this bifurcation, this paredness, this polarity of types makes of all existence and human beings who are on the center line of the advanced architecture of that existence especially poignantly culpable. That polarity was zero and one, as Ahab says to Starbuck in Moby Dick. He says, this drama between thee and me played a billion years before these seas ever rolled. And he confesses later on that uh, it's not the whale that I chiefly hate. It's the malevolent truth behind it that uses the horrors as but a mask to veil its own insidious perniciousness. And its perniciousness is there in masks of hope as well as masks of despair. The masks of hope, the masks of saviors are just as perniciously jeopardizing as the masks of fear. This indeed is, an, is a catastrophic situation to be caught in. And because it is always there on an unbalanced center line, Jung writes this after finishing the quote on, uh, from uh, Schiller, but although this lies in the very nature of its operation, that it frustrates every attempt at adjustment because no section can be brought to see either. That is to say, zero and one form a permanent archetypal, mutually exclusive polarity. They are a disjunctive, best characterized in the West by Parmenides. expressed once by Bertrand Russell in his History of Western Philosophy, Parmenides astonished the virulent, virile, classical Greek mind with an insoluble split. What is, is, and what isn't, isn't. And they never meet. It's the old Zoroastrian split between ultimate evil and ultimate good, they never communicate. And that man finds himself exiled from both and only finds value and proportion as the impossibility of these two meeting draws close enough to make tensions that then occur to him as psychic energy. 
and were they to draw farther apart and be separated, he would be just as blanked out as if they come closer together and the tension is too much to handle. This is what Kierkegaard poignantly called the sickness unto death. That on every level, there is no way to handle this. But there is a way to not handle this. And so whereas the, the via affirmativa, the affirmative way, is very rare. And it's like blessed circumstance of like a Ramakrishna. The via negativa has been developed east and west through large poignant recognitions that one can back away from indefinitely the situation where it's too little or too much and one can literally back into equanimity. But this, of course, is very difficult to do. It's akin to um, the wonderful heroic adventure that uh, Zenavan uh, wrote about in the Anavasis. One has to learn how to have the stamina to be, be to continue and build a strategic retreat. The stamina for a strategic retreat turns out to be one of the strongest virtues of human beings. We can prolong losing for a long time. And this, of course, pisses the devil off and puzzles God. One of the secrets of Prometheus is that he can take it. What does Clint Eastwood say in one of his films when he's smashed and his partner says, how can you do it? He says, I eat the pain. That strategic retreat is a melodramatic version of the, the ability to use the via negativa to back into equanimity. Why is this so? Because zero and one of their very nature are a pair. And if held together long enough, they will like water seek a level of equanimity all by themselves. And where you can't push zero at all, and you can't sell one on any idea, the two of them come into equanimity all by themselves because that's how they were real in the first place. And that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Somebody with wisdom does it and is able to encourage others saying, Eventually, beyond hope, it still happens. And it happens not because you were particularly good, not because you were particularly this or that, but because you particularly never gave up. And so that virtue, one of the Western translations of te is like the translation of the Greek arete, Virtue. Not virtue in goody goody, but virtue in that it remains what it is. It remains real. And in like proportion in equanimity, zero, because one remains real, zero remains ideal. And the bifurcation between realist and idealist eventually shows a great universal balance between them. A balance that is so precise that in that equanimity, both flow into each other and exchange and leave no remainders left over in any columns of any distributive system whatsoever. That the total commutative, is a mathematical term, 
qualities of 0 and 1. Give infinity to the differential expression of that balance between them. So Jung, in commenting on Schiller, he writes, it follows conclusively from this passage. And indeed it is. It's conclusive. It was in the 1920s when Jung looked at it. It was for Schiller in the 1790s. It is for us in the 1990s. It follows conclusively from this passage that though that through the observation of antagonistic mechanisms, Schiller arrived at the conception of two psychological types which claim the same significance in his presentation as I ascribe to the introvert and the extrovert. With regard to the mutual relation between the two types established by myself, I can endorse almost word for word what Schiller says of his. But I can put my endorsement right on that long list. Yes, this is so. It's not so because you need it to be so or you want it to be so. It is so and can be discovered to be such. As Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching twice, he says, how do I know this? By, and then the Chinese word character that he used translates very nicely as thusness, by thusness. The characters are pronounced uh, Tzu Jin. I can endorse almost word for word what Schiller says of his. Schiller, in harmony with what I pointed out earlier in psychological <laughs> types, what I pointed out earlier, reaches the type from the mechanism, since he severs alike from the naive and sentimental character a poetic quality that is common to both. In other words, the realist and the idealist Schiller makes a great deal out of qualities which translate into English terms sentimental and uh, naive. Now, these are not the parlor usages of such terms in the Victorian era, but very powerful, high enlightenment Germanic uh, characterizations. That they're linked together by a poetic quality. What is that poetic quality? The poetic quality, even the term poetic, it comes from the Greek, and the Greek word is poesis. It literally is a gerund which means making. That the poetic quality is there in the way in which the making of anything actually happens just as the Greek word for nature, physis, is an in-process verb. It doesn't mean there or that, it means emerging. Nature is emerging. In the same way, poesis is making. It's all, it's all shaping, doing, creating, creating. that the polarity, in order to maintain itself as real, is already involved in a poesis. One of the great secrets of reality. Even hell has to be made. So that even in the nature of hell, its structure of being made is a primordial quality, and if one is able to leech this poesis from it, its structure becomes unreal and unsustainable in any universe of any dimensions. And that man discovers, like Jung, toughing it out for five years of insanity, or Schiller, toughing it out 
for many years, discovers that if you have the stamina to back into wisdom, one discovers that man has this capacity to delegate creativity and to pull it back in. As Jung discovered yeah, in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, he said his first realization about the nature of neuroses is that if you consciously pull the energy in from them, they go away because they don't have anything to work with. They don't have any nutrition. Projection cannot happen if you don't do it. The projections have no sustaining power by themselves. Unless you continue to do it, they don't happen. It's like the Abhidharma and the high teachings of the Buddha late in his life, after 45 years of teaching. It says several times in the Diga Nikaya, the very first sermon, his translation is the net of all possible problems or the net of all possible solutions. Same thing. That is to say, if at any split second we withdraw the energy that goes into making a construct, it ceases to be. One can have, as the Buddha says, in complete enlightenment at any split second in time. And the only way that a false construct continues is that we do not remember to continue the stopping of it. We let habit we let old conditions carry on as if it were still necessary, if it, as if it were still doable. Just like the problems of the 1990s are just sheer bad habit of an ignorance that should have been cured a long time ago and was, and the disease is still there because people do not remember that it was cured and they keep up the bad habits, the old conditions, as if they were still real. And of course, uh, the habits are so deep, that's why people are reliving the 1950s all over again. It isn't 1950. Fuck the 1950s. So what Jung says in here, if we carry out this operation, we shall have to subtract the gifted creative character. Then to the naive poet there remains the hold to the object and its autonomy in the subject. Notice he's saying that if we withdraw this poesis, even momentarily, there is a radical change in the introvert and the extrovert, the um, naive and the sentimental character because these are universal human types, it undercuts even the bifurcation of male and female. It's deeper than that. Very special transformations happen in the realist and then in the idealist. If that poesis is suspended, you don't even have to have the power to stop it. Just suspend it. Put it into neutral. One of the qualities of Buddhist logic is that it's three value. True and false and neutral. And the neutral is just as real as the true or the false. When you have three value truth trees, you get some very interesting flowering bushes. If we subtract the gifted creative character, the poesis, then the naive to the naive poet there remains the hold to the object and its autonomy in the subject, while to the sentimental there remains the superiority over the object which is expressed in a more or less arbitrary judgment 
or treatment of the object. Hard to follow in Jung. Easier in Schiller. That's why Jung then quotes Schiller. <laughs> Even in German, it's easier. Schiller says it. Schiller is much better literary user, user of language than Jung. However much you like Jung, Schiller really used language well. Here's Schiller. After this, there remains of the former, the naive, nothing else, theoretically, but a dispassionate spirit of observation, a solid dependence upon the equitable testimony of the senses, and practically a resigned submission to the necessity of nature. And so the realist becomes real. David Hume would have loved this. Of the sentimental character, there remains nothing but a restless spirit of speculation, which insists upon the unconditioned in all cognitions, and in practice, a moral severity which insists upon the absolute in every act of will. Whoever counts himself among the former class can be called a realist, and whoever numbers himself with the latter, an idealist. And then Jung goes on to say that with this, a whole interesting typology in Schiller gains a language symbolic quality which transcends into a vision of man. And the first persons to understand Schiller and to be able to begin to see in this way were his uh, correspondence uh, around Goethe. Goethe is the first to be able to begin to see this way. And because of Goethe's writings, not so much of Schiller, but because of Goethe's writings and his influence, two really great German language visionary philosophers arose in the late 19th century. One of them was Friedrich Nietzsche, and the other was Jacob Burckhardt. Nietzsche took that polarity of those two human types and called them the Apollonian and the Dionysian. And Burckhardt took the oneness of it instead of the zero. Nietzsche went for the zero because he was courageous. Burckhardt went for the one and came out with the idea of the superman who is not dealing with zero but is dealing with oneness. A man who is able to extend his personal realm to include the entire state. And so one finds Burckhardt's study of the Renaissance matches beautifully with Friedrich Nietzsche's book on the uh, origins of tragedy, which is the uh, preliminary work for the Apollonian Dionysian uh, typologies. Now we are going to have to take a break here. Sorry for the extended uh, lecture in this mode, but you have to see that these, these intractable situations are like older than the dinosaur bones that are in those um, old rock formations. These are like, I remember I was in Western Canada at, in uh, Alberta, Drumheller, where in this valley there are a lot of dinosaur bones. One of the best sites in the whole world. And I was talking to one of the guys about well, you do this all the time. You must have a fantastic sense of, of time. You're dealing with, you know, 150, 200 million years, as if it's like an everyday consciousness. He said, no. He said, actually, my dad, who lives in upper Ontario, because he says the rocks around the Hudson Bay area are pre-Cambrian rocks. I said, well, how old are those? He said, well, that Canadian shield has been there for almost a billion years. 
He said, when my dad goes out to fish in those lakes, he feels at home in terms of a billion years. He said, I'm only at a couple hundred million years. He said, you ought to talk to my dad sometime. He's really calm. <laughs> Let's come back to Stravinsky. He was talking 55 years ago about value and proportion. Let's start this off with something. This is from the June 2nd, 1995 Economist. Economist is one of the best magazines in the world, British. It's kind of like an economic version of Time magazine. Worldwide distribution. The headline is In Praise of Knowledge. We made Xeroxes of the article. The subtitle is It's Time to Move On from Information. The information age may be at an end. Can you imagine that? Let us hope so, anyway. <laughs> Though it has invariably been described as exciting, a word now applied to anything new, whether a cornflake or a challenge, it has in truth been the opposite. It has provided every boar in the world with a limitless supply of the wherewithal to put his victims asleep. Now, if a harbinger from a Japanese university proves correct, information is giving way to knowledge. Apparently, some companies in Japan have people called vice president, comma, knowledge. They vice preside not over the information technology department, but over the hunches, skills, and insights of the workforce. This is what is meant by knowledge. Well, perhaps by you. A hunch, after all, may be wrong. If so, it would be better described as information or maybe misinformation. But at least skills and insights involve something more than just receiving or producing facts. The trouble with the information age is that it seems to place no value upon differentiation. It goes on from there. And I know that you've heard it many times before, but it's never said. I can't even qualify that. It's never said in university planning sessions about educational strategy. They're still using integral and integrate as if it were just an omnipresent magic word. Whereas it has all the virtue and limitations of a natural process. But all the higher energy processes, all of the higher energy processes transcend integration. And those differential conscious objects, the person and the cosmos, do not occur in nature at all. Nature has to be transformed in order to accommodate the explosive brilliance of persons and the cosmos. So here's some notes on Art 12 some statements. In art, the sequence of a plot is differential, distinct from ritual. In art, sequences in art are distinct from sequences in ritual. In ritual, there must be no deviation for it to be good. I used to show um, a film uh, in Canada, and I brought it down here to the Philosophic Research Society in the late 70s on the Blackfoot Sundance, the Ocon. 
It was filmed in 1966 because it was the last time the, the Blackfoot Nation had all of the implements to be able to put on a sun dance. They'll never put on a sun dance again as long as time lasts. Why? Because all of the ritual implements used in the Okan must be made by four medicine men together. Otherwise, they have no efficacy. And there weren't four medicine men living anymore. And it takes a lifetime to train them. And in 1966, they realized they might as well film it because the tribe, the nation, one of the greatest nations of North America, would never again be able to do the central synthesizing ritual of their religion. When I first used that film in 1970, it was only a year after the old medicine man, Tatanga Mani, walking buffalo, had died at age 97. And I learned from his spirit daughter just how powerful, in terms of differential energy, ritual objects are when they have been transformed into the implements of a visionary consciousness. That is to say, a medicine man in the ancient tradition would never take implements out of their ritual horizon because their usefulness in ritual is that they remain in existence. They remain natural. They don't have a numinous charismatic quality to them at all. They're powerful because they're natural. Whereas to seal a ritual implement, to seal it forever to protect its holiness so it can never be desecrated, but also to seal it so it cannot be misused by someone inappropriately in some other kind of a ritual, a conscientious spiritual person in the old Paleolithic tradition, which the American Indians, North American Indians were, seals that off. And when such a ritual implement is sealed off, it gains a kind of a charismatic burnish. It gains a, a quality of almost uh, electrostatic, um, compelling uh, influence. And when his spirit daughter, who was nearly 80 at that time, unpacked the headdress, the buffalo headdress with the horns and his rattle, which was a buffalo scrotum with the testes uh, dried inside. And because the tribal elders were concerned that these particular implements not go to museums, either to Ottawa or to the Glenbow in Calgary, that they, and because they could not be destroyed, to preserve them from misuse, the decision was made to have them buried secretly out on the reservation so that they would, they would be lost forever, but also they would maintain their holiness and sacredness and never be misused. And in trying to find the right burial place for these. The buffalo headdress, I'll never forget when it was unwrapped, taken down from an old French provincial high boy up on the second story of this old narrow house and, and unwrapped. This kind of almost virulent red hair looked as if the buffalo was still alive, its skull with the horns intact. 
on it. That Tatanga Mani had worn, even as early as the first World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in the 1890s. And there it was. As long as the ritual level was intact, that was a ritual object, and its sacredness was to keep it natural so it had efficacy in the ritual process. And it only had its power when being used in the ritual. As long as it was a ritual object, it had no power outside the ritual whatsoever. It had the quality that I saw one time in an old actress, Carlotta Monte, used to be W.C. Fields' lady. And in her late 70s, they were going to include his W.C. Fields' 1938 uh, Buick, black Buick, into one of these uh, big collections. And uh, they were having a Spago fet for her. And this nice old lady, who was a real movie star, dressed up in her red velvet caped robe, and went into Spago with her heels on and her makeup. And God damn, no way this woman is almost 80 years old, because she knew how to be a star. It's the same thing in a real ritual. The old man who's got a runny nose and his hair is unkempt, all of a sudden, in the right ritual setting, comes alive. The dignity as a masculine figure just rises. And so in that film of the Okan, the old medicine woman narrow it, narrating it, says, of the men who were in the Horn Society, the Eats Kinae, the men who are responsible for preserving the power of the buffalo horns for the people, the power in that ability of the buffalo to gore its way through anything. And she says of men which we had seen earlier in the film, that they're family men and, and the kind of harmless and they like to have their beer and they like to gamble. All of a sudden when they come out with their eats kinai regalia, and she said, now everyone fears these men. No one talks to them. And when they came out, they were different. On film, you can see, even late in the game, 1966, they were different. Frank Waters, in his book, Mask Gods, tells about the time that he saw a Hopi Kachina ceremony, the Powamo, that happens in February, where the first little bean sprouts in the kiva are an indication that the power of life is coming back out of winter. And so the people broadcast this in the Powamo. And he writes about how in early February, as a young boy, he was about nine years old, the first time he ever saw a ritual live. He was sitting on the back of a buckboard parked along with lots of other boys and people on the roofs and the whole village there. This was in the 1910s. And Frank Waters said, when they came with all their ritual regalia on, they were no longer men. They were elemental forces, and there was no question whatsoever. You could feel it. Everyone knew that. The earth knew it. The animals knew it. God knows it. Because man being a spirit can take himself out of nature. And when he puts that spiritual power on, it's like stars shining. It's a whole different an indexing order. That's why nature respects. That's why the ritual 
when done right, has efficacy. Man has always been blessed with that capacity. If he really needs something, and you really do the yoga, and ritual is a Paleolithic yoga, then it really happens. Because the universe has to respond. It's made that way. How is it made? It's, made, it's poesis is that we are on that synthesizing architectural center of the way in which the real and the ideal exchange at a balance. And if one maintains that balance and has the stamina to, there's no way that that doesn't win. That's the way they used to talk in the old Hollywood. You're going to get the deal. It's essentially not because they're convinced, but because there's no other way for it to be real. It, it has to be that way. So in ritual, there must be no deviation. While in art, the differentials always favor complexity and interest in terms of increasing meaning and increasing beauty because it is different. So art displaces ritual in that quaternary, just as vision displaced nature. Nature is no longer the substrate upon which the reality of the square operates. Vision, or as they used to say, in un more unembarrassed uh, millennia, magic. Because consciousness is an operative energy on a magic basis, not on nature. It's not that nature is X'd out, but that it goes subconscious. It gets absorbed into the sub of the substrate. And the new foundation is vision. And whatever can be vision and held, then that is the basis of the real. At the same time, it is also then the basis of the ideal. And as long as that real is held, the ideal can be projected and it will have efficacy. The very basis of alchemy, not just to make gold, but to be able to project the projective power of that gold. In nature, gold is what it is. The necklace, the coin, the earring, the ingot. It's an integral reality, but alchemical gold is judged not by carrots, but by its projective power. You can't find in nature gold much purer than 24 carats. But alchemical gold has an infinite projective power. And when you read in the real literature, you read that the projective power sometimes is thousands of times, not just 24 karat, but thousands of times. But as Trithemius wrote in a letter cautioning Agrippa, about 450 years ago. He said, be careful about talking about these things to the unlearned because um, you get gored by the stubborn ox of in ignorance more frequently than not. For us, the oomph of this recognition is that as vision displaces nature, art displaces ritual. And what was a integral virtue, that there be no deviation, that the ritual be done with as much exactness, that the respect for the ritual is for the exactness. Because only the exactness of the form guaranteed that the power, the charisma of the objects would not get out of hand. 
because they can become so powerful that if you remain just tribal, if you don't shift into and it lets yourself be absorbed as an elemental power, if you think that you're still a man in the tribe, those ritual objects then get you. They have you. They commandeer you. One they don't let go. Then you have to call in somebody who knows what to do. And so on the ritual level, in true tribal veracity, those ritual objects are always made, the poesis of them, bringing them into being, is always made by several, in the Blackfoot nation it was four, almost always in North America except for the Hopis, and other Uto Aztecan language groups it was always uh, four, the Navajos, the Blackfoot. All the Athabascan and Algonquin language groups always had four. Because it's the focus of their collective poesis that makes that real in such a way that it can be handled and not be jeopardizing to someone that some woman or some man of the tribe is not going to be jeopardized by using it. Where if it's made by one person, very often if there's a hidden imbalance in that person, it goes into the objects. And we think that we're really mature and can laugh at malevolent objects, but not many human beings have ever laughed at malevolent objects on tribal level. Now an object as large and as transcendent as civilization is not handleable by tribal people. One little taste of it and they become radioactive, poisoned, and they're done for. And it's not a function that the tribe was unhealthy. It's not a function of them being degenerate members of a tradition that had lost its integrity. Right at full integrity, at full health, completely radioactive poison. Why? Because cannot handle that kind of form at all. Differential forms are poisonous. They're radioactive to tribal cultures. So there has to be a buffer. There has to be an insulation. And so the universe, in order to maintain its reality, because it, Mother Nature favors the differential as well as the integral, She likes you to spend money as well as to save money. It doesn't make much difference to her as long as you play at one of these and best at both. So the buffer that the universe has is that the integral energy is disjunctive to the differential energy. That tribe and consciousness are disjunctive. They never meet but they do participate together in a large complementarity in which they are paired. But the form that holds that large complementarity is transcendental. It's not integral at all. There's no integral form that can hold it. It's like fusion power. Where, what are you going to have to hold fusion power? Or it's like the uh, material that then is superconductive. You can raise it to level uh, so that it's above liquid nitrogen, but it's still very, very, very cold. But even at that, it's brittle and doesn't work because it doesn't hold form. Why? 
because supernatural objects, supernatural processes are of a differential energy ilk, and they have nothing to do with the, quote, normal, natural universe. They're disjunctive to it. And it's naive to think that someone who gets matured then is condemned to alienation. This is a joyful message of Nietzsche. You're going to go through a period, you're going to go through this buffer zone where it seems like you're going to be completely outlawed, alienated. It'll pass. But one has to remember that the integral forms are being displaced by the differential forms. And just as vision displaces nature, and you have to remember that that's the way it's working now with consciousness. And when art displaces ritual, you have to remember that that's now what's going on. And in two weeks, when we come to really crucial thing where history displaces myth, all the processes in the quaternary now are differential. None of them are integral. Nature and myth were integral processes. And when vision as a differential replaced nature, you had one integral and one differential. It was difficult, but it wasn't that bad. But when history comes into play, all the energy is now differential. None of it's integral. And if you don't remember that, if you don't know that, if you don't learn how to navigate in that, and you just carry over the old habits from tribal level, you will make a virtue, as they do, say, in 1990s architecture, that disassociative forms are what are pretty. Well, no way they're pretty. They're just as much garbage as ever. They were garbage then, they're garbage now. It's not some subtle new aesthetic then that's hip. It's just bad architecture. There's, they're searching for me. <laughs> as soon as I finish, I'm going to go out and find them. <laughs> so in art, come back to these notes. In art, the sequence, the sequencing is different from the sequencing in ritual. In ritual, you have to constantly check against nature to see that this selectivity has got it right, that the images are true to their reference. Whereas in vision, it's destructive to keep checking every image against nature to see that it's representational. Because in vision, if images are representational, you're making errors. <laughs> and the longer you continue that, the further you're going to skew away from anything that's real, and the more difficult it's going to be because of confusing the two, you get into a true limbo. You don't know what to think. You don't know what to do. And because you didn't transform your imagination, the imagination begins to work against you. Why shouldn't it? You son of a bitch. You're going against the grain that we know is right. You didn't take the trouble to inform the imagination, to teach it like the child and raise it. Yes, that's right. Good imagination. You learned to make images that were checkable against nature and because the representation was selective but still accurate, those were good images. They are very nourishing, useful images. But in the differential mode of vision, the natural referent of images is, is destructive. In fact, it's regressional. It's bad form. It ain't logical. And when we come in to see history at play, and I've seen it many times now, 
almost nobody gets it. Almost nobody gets it. Instead, there are mythic fantasizations that are put forth as if they are histories and nothing to do with history. Nothing. Not a thing. Sorry. It's not that it's not well done. It's just irrelevant. I usually in the past have said nothing. But I'm trying to teach in a way now that it, at least it's accurate enough comes across in this particular record. And also to give you some, some kind of bona fide taffy to pull. I'm going to try in the history section this time to work with you individually, initially in the first two or three, four sessions, to look at the first page of your histories with you. You don't need a total exam. I'm old-fashioned kind of country doctor. All I have to do is put the little popsicle stick in and say, ah, one syllable. Yeah, you're okay. Or you've got a fever. Those fantasies are going. How about, how about taking a pill of transcendence and, and, and get over that? Painless. Because in the history section, your basic assignment is to write your own personal history of the last two years. And because the history section is three quarters of the second year, when you finish your history, you will have had to include the three months before you even began this course as a part of this course. And if you do that right, it means that you will have developed the talent and the technique, the posture and the balance, to be able to then project the integral and differential qualities of this course back into your previous line. Because if you can do the three months previous and you learn how to do that and include that, you can project it then all the way back as far as you want to go. Now, I'm not just talking about childhood as far back as you want to go, because the laws of karma work both ways. They corral you, and they must themselves be corralled by you when you work consciously with them. It's like going back the same way. Like a nice little computer program has all these complications for you that you can't get anything done unless you follow the rules by going down the page. But if you start at the bottom, of a non-existing page and start an eraser process going back through, it doesn't have any defenses at all to stop you from erasing every single crap snag that's there. Now that's a therapeia. That's the Vimala Kirti cure. You know the Vimala Kirti Sutra? One of the great high dharma sutras. Vimala Kirti is, is is sick. And the Buddha says to his disciples, he says, I hear that Vimala Kirti is sick. Will somebody go over and check on him? And none of the disciples make a move to do this. And then finally, one of the senior monks says, well, every time we go, because we have done this, he gets us into a discussion and we lose a track of Dharma because he's very sharp. His logic is impeccable. And we don't want to lose track and, and, and lose heart. So that's why none of us have gone to see Vimla Kurti. And so the Buddha then says, well, perhaps one of the gods should go and talk to Vimla Kurti. And the gods send emissary and they say to Buddha, well, you know, we've had the same problem with Vimla Kurti. He is so exact and so precise that we have trouble maintaining ourselves as gods when we talk with him. And so the Buddha stands up and he goes to visit Vimla Kirti. And because everybody's interested, and because it's like a transcendental space, the whole thing gets crowded. It says in the sutra that there are about 
4,000 monks there and about 5,000 bodhisattvas and 20,000 gods and creatures from all over the tri-cosmic uh, universe come to sit in to see, to see this. <laughs> the Buddha against Vimalakirti. And the Buddha comes in and he says to Vimalakirti, how are you? <laughs> and Vimalakirti says, perhaps trace of smile. He says, I'm sick. And the Buddha says, well, what are you sick of? And Vimalakirti says, of existence. As long as the universe is ill, I have no choice but to be ill myself. And I will be better when the universe is cured. Do you have any suggestions? And so the Vimalakirti Sutra is all about this further dialogue. And it's interesting because in the Sutra, all of the untrained gods, all of the untrained monks, even some junior bodhisattvas, as soon as the Buddha and Vimalakirti start dancing together, as soon as zero and one start to interplay with equanimity, the cosmos begins raining flowers. Only to these not-so-good monks and not-so-hot gods and very young teenage bodhisattvas, the flowers stick to them. And so the whole background, the whole transcendental room filled with creatures trying to brush these flowers off them, whereas on the Buddha and Vimalakirti, uh, the rain of flowers just is like this wash of blessedness. When history comes into play and displaces myth, all of the energy processes then in the square, all of the conscious processes are differential. And if you're carrying over integral habits of any kind that have not been transformed, the rain of flowers is going to seem like a curse to you. The rain of blessedness is going to be like something wrong. That's a symptom that you're, you're running a fever. And the fever is the illness of existence. Not some bug you caught but in the very nature of the buggedness of reality itself. So further notes, rituals have an integral purpose in their selective repetitiveness, fortified by repetitiveness. Art has a differential prowess in the variable parallels. Now there's all the difference in the world between parallels and repetitiveness. The synthesizing differential that allows for forms of parallelness to occur with infinite variability is consonance. When Stravinsky talks about the high mathematics of musical form, giving value and proportion, not on basis of drumming. <laughs> no matter how manly and vigorous you're drumming, it is not going to work because it's irrelevant. Even if you get 50 guys in a cave hidden away in the Amazon jungle, you make your own drums, and you're all naked under full moon and you drum like hell, it's still irrelevant. <laughs> Why? Because the energy form now is differential rather than integral. So when you hear, for instance, opening percussive sequence of the rite of spring, you realize that ancient caveman has been transcended completely into infinite artist. And if someone is still 
habitual and conditioned. Even if that conditioning is supposedly on high enough level to be like Paris Music Hall 1912, first thing from hearing sequence of Rite of Spring, everybody starts fighting with everybody else and screaming. And that's what happened. The very first performance of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring was colossal brawl. No one heard the music at all. Stravinsky and Diaghilev personally congratulated the orchestra that they finished playing the piece because no one listened to it at all. No one heard it the first time it was played because it was disjunctive totally. No one brought consciousness to the concert hall. They brought Paris, Parisian, concert hall conditionedness and habituation. And even expecting something new, they expected something new in a conditioned way. They went something conditioned new. And uh, Stravinsky, young Stravinsky, he was really new. He was differential. Whereas just a few years later, after a little bit of taste of World War I, when Rite of Spring was first played in London, he got standing ovation. Not because the London crowd was any more sophisticated than the Parisian crowd, indeed, not even as sophisticated. But they had relinquished the habitual conditioning of what was expected to be new, and they were ready to receive something differentially, and they did. Which is why Stravinsky was invited to give the uh, poetics of mu music, the poesis of music. Now, music on ritual level is very identifiable. Ritual music, very identifiable. In fact, one could say that the archetypal ritual implement is the drum. And the drum beat on ritual level, which approximates heartbeat, is universal, integrating, synthesizing language. It's a sound like a language, and that percussive beat, the drum, the heartbeat drum, carries all the way through the entire uh, integral synthesizing uh, method. One can even carry it and say that the ultimate of that is like the Heart Sutra, that the Hridaya Sutra is the drumbeat of the heart as a synthesizing, integrating pace carried from ritual through myth, through the mind, all the way to point of realization. First thing that one does in realization is forget that you depend upon Heart Sutra. Very first thing. It's radical, disjunctive transformation. The first disciples around Jesus were all um, disciples of John the Baptist. They were all Essenes. And they're all saying to Jesus, well, what about John the Baptist? Super, super man. And Jesus said, yes, he is. He's the best there is among men. But even the least baby in the new kingdom is above him. Instantly, irrevocably, disjunctively, forever. There's a beautiful Japanese print done by Toshi Yoshida. His father, Hiroshi, brought the Japanese print back into play in the 1920s after he had languished for several generations. 
And Toshi Yoshida did a print that had a beautiful burnt orange horizon like the clay earth of India and this pale beautiful sky that one would get in the dusty Deccan in central India on hot days. And in between the burnt orange, the burnt sienna, and the pale blue was a Sanskrit word written in such a way that the dusty orange and the pale blue were interchanged almost in a scintillation. And the word in Sanskrit letters was illusion. Only someone who could read the word consciously and understand it could meld earth and sky into a unity visionary. Where someone who didn't know Sanskrit, who wasn't conscious to extent of language, would just see this as a design on the earth and the sky as separate. The sky above, the earth below. Archetypal separation. Heaven and earth separate. They only meld together. They only, in a complementarity, come into exchange through the visionary process. That's the first time, only time, that they begin to be able to distribute themselves into each other. Disjunctive polarities don't make love until there's absolutely true nudity of no longer any conditions or habits whatsoever. Then they make love. Otherwise, the tension of the shame rises proportionately with the attempts to force them together, and you get into cosmic rape stuff. The guilt is uh, catastrophic. So as an example, I chose one example here. I know the time is over, but I chose one example. This is just for us. If you'll listen to a short work by Brahms, it's a work that's very famous. I'm sure that you've heard it many times in your life. It's called Variations on a Theme by Haydn. And then look up and find the Haydn piece. And listen to the Haydn piece. In ritual, from a ritual standpoint, Brahms doing variations on a theme of Haydn is a transgression. But as an artist, Brahms' variations on that theme by Haydn is one of the best works of art in the whole musical repertoire. It just simply shows the amazing qualities, the transcendent qualities of a differential consciousness of first order, taking what was a theme out of a natural integration, but because it was a musical theme, it was already an artistic handling of it. Brahms could take Haydn's art and could do variations on it. It's one of the best examples there is of just very briefly in about a half an hour of letting yourself experience what happens with the differential powers of art as opposed to the integral energies of ritual. No way to denigrate ritual. No way. Absolutely indispensable. But its indispensability is in the proportion in which it is real. And in consciousness, ritual is not real. In consciousness, ritual comportments are illusionary. It can be a beeswax candle and you can light it with Krishna's blowtorch. <laughs> it's no goddamn use. You can sprinkle water from the Ganges in drops that look like the Pleiades and chant the most wonderful little Michael Jackson hymn. 
It's not going to help because ritual comportment is illusory when carried over into art. This is why the very first thing that a young artist learns is not to talk about his art with people that are not appreciative. You have to learn, you just don't talk with them, that's all. And while it's somewhat difficult but learnable in terms of art, it's almost unlearnable because of titanic impossibility to learn that in history. That if you carry over mythic comportment into history, you're done for. If you try to knit a civilization together on terms of mythology, you're heading for the abyss. For one thing, the whole interiorization of mythic languages leads to a vanishing point. It leads to that abyss of realization. It's meant to. It doesn't lead to pearly gates. It leads to shunyata. That's its nature. It should do. It was made that way from the origin. Language structures were made to vanish into high symbolic condensed Bindu. The fact that there are creative imaginations and magical languages like Rumi doesn't detract whatsoever from what is being said here. Because Rumi's mythologies are all transcendentally made shimmering by vision. And we'll see during the interval uh, next, I think, isn't that uh, uh, Ibn Arabi, the Bezels of Wisdom. This creative imagination that comes out has a particular setting. A bezel is the setting for a, a gemstone. The ring which holds the gemstone is the bezel. And Ibn Arabi says that in creative imagination, the bezel that holds it is the person. The mystical person is the setting of the jewel of consciousness. And so when you open up Ibn Arabi and you look at the table of contents, it's not candle burning 1A. It's not all these other things. It's not shamanism on summer solstice. Not a, it's names. Moses, Jesus, Abraham. Why? Because in differential energy, the person, the mystic person, is the right setting for the jewel of consciousness. And when the jewel of consciousness is put into the setting of the person, then an energy is released called history, which really comes into play and displaces myth. And once you have vision and art and history, then for first time, one gets a glimpse of the other shore. One gets a glimpse of the cosmos. And as Ibn Arabi, characteristically, someone who grew up in Andalusia, southern Spain, in that gorgeous climate, Southern California style micro weather, and then was moved to Egypt, went from Andalusia to, to Egypt, went from the, the, the California dried to grassy brown golden hills and, and copses of dark green trees of Andalusia, and was put there in the archetypal center of the medulla of the Nile River, Cairo. Ibn Arabi had that uh, wonderful quality to be able to bring out the creative, creative imagination, not just imagination, but a creative imagination that differentially made available to him 
a language in which he could see that there was a cosmic person on the other shore beckoning to him to come over, to come, to come home into the cosmos. And he says of her, this was the first time I experienced love in its reality in this way. First time. And even someone like Ibn Arabi, it took him a while to learn that um, you don't just wave back, but you, you go ashore. Yeah. I remember once about 35 years ago, somebody was in a philosophy class at the University of Wisconsin, and we had this uh, French dandy teacher, E.F. Kaling, who was wonderful, he's an existentialist. And somebody was finally getting aesthetics of how to look at paintings and, and, and see things. And, and suddenly it occurred to her that art was quite real. And she said, well, Professor Kalin, well, what do, you, what do you do next then? He said, my dear, you live. <laughs>